Yeah, yeah. I think we're good to go. Um, cool. So, I mean, dude, let's just jump in. First of all, this is fucking wild for me. Because, <laughs> bro, the first time I ever, probably the first time I ever saw you on YouTube, you yeah. had like 50,000 subscribers maybe. And I just was watching a video. You're at 170,000 subscribers. Yeah, man. Working on two, 200K, one, 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 uh, one individual at a time. You know yeah. what I mean? That's incredible, man. Like, so before I get into the growth you've gotten to right now, I yeah. want to ask like just a couple of things about just like your way early life. I want to really get deep on like the Adam Ivy journey. So like, tell me a little bit about like how you grew up, where you grew up, what that was like when you were like a kid. Yeah, man. So uh, I grew up in central Wisconsin. I'm a little bit older than you. I'm uh, 34 years old, graduated high school in 2002, 2003. Um, and I grew up with, you know, kind of a upper lower class, lower middle class upbringing, a blue collar, you know, community. You know, my parents, my mom always worked two jobs. My dad was in a major car accident when I was an infant and had a fused, not a fused, but a fractured back um, because of it. So he was, he's been on disability and um, trying to make by, you know, trying to make do throughout my entire life was a stay at home dad was great stay at home dad. He's a great cook. He's, you know, he's handy. And that's where I learned a lot of my mechanical abilities from is through my grandfather and my dad. Um, you know, I fell in love with sports and I was in martial arts for 12 years when I you know, started in first grade because of the, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And uh, yeah, man. So it's just like, you know, my life in Wisconsin was very average when it came to kind of like my, my surroundings and my community. You know, we, you know, we had a little ranch style house and, you know, I walked to school every day. I mean, it's, it's nothing crazy out of the norm, but you know, my, my household always had a little bit more love than it did money. And so relationships and, and just treating your family and friends, you know, well was always kind of important to me. And, you know, being the oldest of three boys, uh, I was kind of, you know, taking care of my little brothers and bringing them up. And in, in a lot of ways, I feel like that transferred into my current life with really enjoying helping others really enjoying and, and getting a lot of fulfillment out of bringing, you know, education and, and understanding the people who are in need of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then with my mentorship program, being able to help one-on-one, -on -one, a lot of my students kind of feel like younger siblings to me because a lot of them are in their twenties or teens. Um, and, and just being able to see those progressions happen working together is, is, is awesome. But, you know, uh, right around the age of 14, I was a super, super skinny kid, graduated ninth grade at 103 pounds. So I uh, started working out and lifting weights. And at one point in my life, I wanted to become a certified personal trainer. And another part of my life, I wanted to do, uh, you know, have an auto body shop that would work on custom import tuners and stuff. So I know that it's all over the place right now with what's going on. But all of that to say that when I discovered music, uh, my late teens, early twenties, that was really the switch that was like, I want to do this and I want to do this for the rest of my life. So, uh, packed up everything I owned, everything I could fit into a 94 Nissan Altima at about 22 years old, I believe moved to central Florida. And essentially I've been here for since then, since, uh, 2007. Okay. So yeah, that's really interesting. Wow. That's a lot. So first of all, I know <laughs> I just threw it all, threw it all on you, man. No, that's good. That's exactly the stuff I wanted to hear. Like, I'm really sorry about what happened to your dad, man. That's, that's tough. I'm sure that was It tough. happens, man. I mean, he's a, he's a great guy. I mean, he was in, v in the Vietnam War. So, I mean, he, oh. he had already been through some adversities in his life. But, uh, you know, he's, he's able-bodied for the most part now. I mean, he's getting a little bit older. Um, but, you know, I think it was a gift and a curse because ultimately I always felt like he wanted to do more. But he was a hustler, man. I mean, he was a DJ. He owned a tavern when I was very young, uh, a bar that unfortunately burnt down. Um, so that kind of put those dreams on hold for him. But as a, as a stay at home dad, man, I mean, I learned how to do brake jobs and change out transmissions on cars and do yard work and um, just really established a work ethic through my dad who, you know, I had a paper route for three and a half years and only missed four days and three and a half years as a, as a paper boy with, you know, two or 300 papers a day. And in the middle of the winter, he'd be right behind me in the truck with the papers in the truck. And I'd go house, 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 go back and grab as many papers as my little arms could hold. House, 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 apartment complex, apartment complex. Uh, and he would get up at four o'clock in the morning to, to help me with that. So 
um, yeah, shout out to my dad. You know, he, he, uh, was a, was a very devoted father to us. And, uh, yeah. Dude, that is so sick, man, that you had a paper route. That's crazy. And that your dad was right there with you the whole time. Definitely, man. We didn't, like I said, we didn't grow up with a lot of money. So I always had like Goodwill clothes and Salvation Army stuff or Walmart, Kmart stuff. And, you know, as you get into middle school and high school, I mean, we all kind of go through it. There's the, you know, the classism that kind of starts with, oh, that's the poor kid. That's the rich kid. That's the druggie. That's the jock. And I didn't want to be the poor kid. So at 12 years old or 12 and a half, I took on a paper route and you know, by the time I was 13 or 14, I was making $385 a month with my paper out and I was buying Tommy Hilfiger and Nautica and Ralph Lauren and, you know, so that I could kind of fit in more. I was working to fit in um, and they didn't know I was working a job, but that's why I was also pretty, pretty bad at school because I didn't really prioritize homework, but right. I, I was making money, I guess. That was my priority back then. Right. Sure. No, I was the yeah. same not a very good student back in the day either because I just had other things in my head. What's, what's a good student really even mean? It's subjective. Right. It's a, we showed up for the most part. Yeah. Um, did, you get, did you go to college? Just curious. So I went to college like years after I graduated high school, just thinking like, you know, this is the best way to do it. I mean, I'd already been making music, but there was a part of my life was like, you know, maybe, maybe I'll go to college and, and learn something. And I was uh, I went to college for about three semesters to become an IT manager. And about one semester in, I realized that this is not what I want to do. Uh, it was very expensive. I went to DeVry University, which is uh, historically kind of one of those um, predatory for-profit colleges. And three semesters in, I already owed them about $11,000. And I said, yeah, no, no, I could have bought a really nice, like, computer or something with that and made better music with all the all the sounds and stuff I could have bought with that money so I dropped out I mean this is a long time ago now but um, you know I paid off that student loan which felt incredibly liberating and uh, the structuring and logic of, of or common sense doesn't necessarily tie into this the college system for me like why do I have to take 15 different gen eds when it has nothing to do with my major and yet you're charging me a premium for this stuff that doesn't have anything to do with my my major I just it just felt kind of scummy to me it felt like I was in a bad infomercial every time I'd show up for class and so yeah, it just wasn't for me yeah oh my god dude I mean we could get into the whole education system for oh yeah yeah I could go off on that for sure yeah, yeah. <laughs> talk to me about how you discovered music because it sounds like you had your mind on a lot of different things and then somehow music came to be that thing how did music come to be that thing for you Okay, so you know, funny enough, I was working in a wood window factory from the time I was 18 years old to about 21, almost four years. And in that time, I had started a um, used car lot with a buddy of mine who I worked with uh, called Hyperspec Automotive, where we were only going to sell European and Japanese tuner cars. Um, that fell through because of a uh, renewal of the zoning where he owned the property and I did everything else. And he, and it doesn't matter, but long story short, I found myself in a position where I was just, I felt stuck because at 21 years old, I, I had about 27 people underneath me at this wood window factory that I was working at. I was the union steward um, of the Teamsters union there. I was the lead person of the department. So I had like maxed out. And one time, one of my guys who was in his early fifties said to me, he goes, Adam, uh, must be, must be pretty awesome. I'm like, what are you talking about, Mike? He goes, you're like at the top of the food chain around here already. And you're barely 20 years old. And what he threw to me as a compliment, I got terrified by, and I felt claustrophobic and, and, and kind of, uh, suffocated all of a sudden. So I had, in that recent period of time, one of my best friends had a house and in his twenties, he was renting out rooms to people and buddies and stuff like a lot of people do. And kind of by happenstance, I crossed paths with a guy named Zach who goes by the name of DJ DeVille, who in our little city, our little town was the mixtape guy was the, there was two clubs and he was DJing both of the clubs. He was kind of the name. And so it was funny cause I had stopped over there to talk to Jim cause Jim was one of my best friends. And Zach was there and Jim was like, hey, Adam, I want you to meet Zach. He goes by the name of DJ DeVille. You might have heard of him. And it's funny because I had one of his mixtapes in my car in the CD player and I had never met this guy. So Zach just heated up some pizza rolls or whatever, you know, he was eating back then. He's like, I'm actually working on some music downstairs if you want to come check out my little, my little setup. And I just fell in love with that man. I mean, he was using Reason. And so, you know, I, I asked him, I said, what do I need 
to do this? What do I need to make beats and do this type of stuff? And on the back of an old junk mail envelope, he wrote down, you know, uh, reason, uh, a pair of headphones, like the bare minimum, right? Yeah. So I had a uh, 2001 Honda CBR 929 that I, I almost like immediately sold as a motorcycle. And I used that money to buy the cheapest laptop I could find that would run Reason. I bought Reason 2.5, a MIDI controller, um, a cheap pair of headphones. And then I was using like stereo speakers in a home audio receiver with just an aux plug into the laptop wow. as my studio monitors to start. And that was how it all started. I, I fell in love with the process so much, but I knew that it was clunky for me because I was already 20 or 21 years old. I'm like, it's going to take me forever to get good with this. So with the extra money that I had saved from my day job that I was working 60 or 70 hours a week, plus the motorcycle money, uh, I quit my day job just to do beats like 10 hours a day. Just, I knew that I had enough runway, even if I were to go back to a day job, I wanted to really get good with this. Mm. Um, so like maybe three or four months, I just focused on learning how to sequence beats and drums and figure out how to kind of play the keys. And um, yeah, that's kind of when I decided to move to Florida to pursue music production. So why Florida though? So it's a funny story. So Zach, AKA DJ DeVille, shout out DJ DeVille. Um, he went to school down here at Full Sail. So Full Sail is a music production school. A lot of people have heard of it. And back when he went, it was this one little building. The It cost about $17,000 to go there. As far as like now, it's like 85,000 on average, something like that. And he's like, he painted this picture of Central Florida being like this oasis or this uh, euphoric place to be. Um, used some somewhat of a utopia and I came down here and I hated it for the first year or two but it also kind of forced me into learning who I was as a man as a creative like what I was going to do because I didn't have any backup I had never been to Florida I came down here with $3,400 in my pocket and a Nissan Altima and I moved into a garage apartment that one of Zach's former college friends had and like it was a bunch of different like little buddy hang out hookups, you know, like I'll stay in your garage for six weeks until I get an apartment. And then he let me stay a couple extra weeks and I found a job and I got an apartment in the hood because everything looks nice during the day here. Um, I was like one of two white guys in this apartment complex for two years. And uh, it was fun, man, but it, it just was, it was a big eye opening experience. And um, I knew that staying in Wisconsin to kind of round back and answer your question a little bit more uh, solidly. I knew that if I stayed in central Wisconsin at that time in 2006, um, that I, I don't feel like I would have ever grown. I would have been stagnated by the people around me telling me that I was chasing a delusional dream or whatever, you know, because they didn't understand it. I didn't really understand it, but I knew that if I stayed there, I certainly wouldn't understand it. So I kind of just, I kind of escaped it in a way. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So you just needed some place to get out of your, you needed to get out of your comfort zone, you felt like. Yeah, I felt like I had to challenge myself. And the only way I couldn't dabble with it, I'm not like a one toe in the water kind of guy. I'm either like jump in, drown, jump, jump in and completely fail and learn from it, move on, or I don't really mess with it at all. And I mean, that kind of goes to show with me quitting my day job that I was making, you know, 40 grand a year as a 21 year old living in central Wisconsin, where my apartment rent was like three or 400 bucks a month um, to just using the money I had. I mean, I didn't even care if I had to move back in with my parents or whatever. I was like, I need to learn this program and I'm not going to do it spending 30 or 40 minutes a day on it, you know? Right. So, so yeah. you were what you said you were 21 when you were, when you were like really getting started. Yeah. Yeah. 20. I didn't, you know, I took piano lessons. My grandmother was a pianist and an organist and my mother was a award-winning scholarship receiving a violin player when she was 16 or 17. Uh, my dad was a DJ, like I said. So I came from kind of a, like, Music was a big part of my upbringing, but I never really paid attention to it until uh, I kind of fell in love with the concept of beat making. And I jumped in at like, yeah, I'd say like 21 years old, 2021. Uh, I think 2005 was when I technically started dabbling in it. And 2006 is when I started taking it more seriously. Because I started, I started making beats in the interim of selling that motorcycle and buying Reason and stuff. I had a burnt copy of like FL or Fruity Loops, uh, four, 4.0 4 or something. Um, and so I, I, you know, I was using the keyboard as a, uh, the, the typing keyboard as a music keyboard by having a caps lock on or whatever. So I was, I was really dabbling with that. And then I would, I, I would export the audio and then 
pull it back into the mic input and then record it into Cool Edit Pro because I had a demo version of FL, so I couldn't save anything. So I would have to like kind of track it out every single beat that I would do. I would export it or like play it through the headphone jack and then it was like a loop out through the headphone, in through the microphone, and then into Cool Edit Pro. It was like the most backward setup ever, but it worked. And, and, and then I got Reason. And then I, a few years later in 2008, I, I jumped into uh, Logic Pro 9. Yeah. Okay. And I've been in Logic ever since. Yeah. So for just for like people who are listening who like aren't music people, I have a few people who listen who don't know. Basically, like what we're hearing is you had to just kind of you didn't have the most luxurious, the best setup. You just were like, I got what I got. So I got to get, I do just felt, did you feel like, cause I think we kind of had a similar thing with like starting. Did you feel like you just needed to start no matter what? Yeah, I didn't know. You know, one of my, my quotes that I say a lot in my videos is use what you have until what you have pays for what you want. And I, I didn't have any other options. I could have went and bought a Moti for a, a Cork Triton was the big keyboard back then. And I was just like, I don't, I don't need that. You know, I just need the bare minimum. I need to learn the bare minimum before I'm upgrading or expanding or, cause it doesn't make sense to get your driver's license and then go buy a Ferrari. Cause you, you have no idea what you're doing yet. So um, I'm, I'm a firm believer in using what you have because what the technology that we have now is head and shoulders better than it was 10 years ago, which was head and shoulders better, better than it was 10 years before that. So our little rinky dink starter setup now is something that someone might have had to save for for like a year 20 years ago or might not have even existed. So we take that for granted and we look at what you know the Peter McKinnons of the world are using for cameras or you know what what the big boys are using as far as full blown SSL consoles and you know plugins till you your eyes are bleeding, but you don't need all that to get started. No, I, I completely agree with you. It's like Okay, this is kind of an interesting thing related. You know, uh, you know Splice.com, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, Splice.com is like a really great website that you can use to download like sounds and loops and stuff like that. So, and like what's cool also, you know, like real professional producers use Splice, like Sunny Digital and like sure. live from 808 Mafia upload sounds. Yeah. So the dude from 808 Mafia, his name I think is Southside. He like did a video with Splice, like his commercial, and he said, yeah. He's like, dude, if I had Splice when I was coming up, I would have blown up way faster. And that really like, it kind of goes to what you're saying. Like the stuff that we have is like the social media, the Insta, bro, the fact that you and I are connecting is yeah. nuts because like the only way we connected it was the internet. And it's yeah. like, I mean, and I've been in this for a little less than you. I've only been in this for like nine years, like five years ago, or I remember before Instagram was invented. So like yeah. we wouldn't have connected with, without the internet. So do you feel like, I mean, I'm sure you get this cause you're a teacher and you provide value through courses. Like, do you feel like, do you feel like people are putting excuses and not really realizing the opportunities with that they have? Yeah. I mean, people have always been using excuses. I mean, it's just now they have a voice to bitch and moan about it on Facebook. I'm sorry if I cursing on your show. All good. Okay. Well, you know, I think that people have always been complaining. People have always complained like, oh, well, I don't have a good job because I couldn't get into college. Oh, it must be nice being able to have those opportunities, but I don't live in a big city with a bunch of, like, there's always been excuses probably since before they started slicing bread. The issue is now that everybody has a voice and everybody wants to be famous and they think that they're so close to getting there without the work. They look at themselves behind a screen. They see somebody like Sunny Digital or Scott Storch or Drake or Adele, like it doesn't matter. And they say like, oh, I could, I could do that. I'm better. It's like, but you're not. Because <laughs> ethic is, is that connecting chain that a lot of people don't have. Yeah. And then people then use excuses to make themselves validated for why they're not taking action. So they'll say, well, you know, I, I'm going to start a YouTube channel, but I need a better camera. Or I'm going I'm to start selling my beats, but I, I just need to get better at mixing. Or like whatever, the, I mean, you could be a baker. I'm going to open up a bakery as soon as I figure out how to make gluten-free snacks. I'm going to uh, start a pavement company as soon as I have a better truck. Like yeah. people make excuses. It's just we hear more about the excuses now more than ever 
but it, they're, they've always existed, man. Just like you said with Sunny Digital saying, if he had Splice 10 years ago, he would have blown up way faster. It's bullshit, 100% bullshit. Because if everybody had access to Splice 10 years ago, it might've been more oversaturated and he might've never had a voice. Oh. So he's not living in the present. I mean, obviously it's a paid ad, so he's gonna say whatever they're paying him to say. But ultimately, we can't go back and say, oh, I would, I would have blown up on YouTube if I started in 2005. Right. Not necessarily, not necessarily. Because if, if people would have known the power of YouTube now back then, YouTube would, have be, would be a completely different animal now, right? So the, the fact of the matter is you have to use the skills, you have to use the resources and what you can afford now and the networking. People are afraid to pick up the phone. People are afraid to get online and, and send an email or connect with somebody. That's why they say, hey, check out my track, check out my mixtape, check out my beats. Because they don't know how to have a conversation with someone. Yeah. They don't know how to tell somebody something or kind of regurgitate something that they saw on, online, but they don't, they don't put in the, the work. They don't have the intestinal fortitude to kind of fail and get better at it and learn. You know, if you've ever had a sales job, you know what it's like to be a complete doofus in the beginning and be like, oh, hey, um, really think you should buy one of these. Well, you know, maybe upgrade to this. It's way more expensive. Well, what's the benefit? I, I don't know. Like we all start at a certain point, but so many people start fall one time and say, well, I'm not good at walking. I, I fell down. Mm. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to sit down and be safe the rest of my life. And I don't really subscribe to that because not to pat myself on the back or, or sound like some type of, uh, uh, you know, Messiah or anything, but it's like, I didn't have anything handed to me. My parent, my, I don't, I don't think my mom pulled in more than $20,000 my entire upbringing, you know, working two jobs. I mean, weren't making any money. Like, all generic food, all generic clothes, all, you know, like never went out to eat. That was not a thing. Going to the movies was not a thing unless I had my own money. That's why I got my paper out. But I'm from central Wisconsin where country music and classic rock are what, what is, you know, I mean, it's evolved now, but uh, if I could become successful on YouTube or, or with my music or whatnot, anybody can. It's just the difference between somebody being built for it and somebody sitting behind excuses the rest of their life and being 60 or 70 years old saying, Oh, I could have, I could have, I would have, I should have like, shut the fuck up. Right. <laughs> totally. And yeah. I love, I can see how passionate you're getting um, just from getting into this subject. It's, it's, dude, it's crazy. I think the same things as you about like just the excuses. Uh, I'm wondering too, cause you are big on speaking to an audience, right? And you speak to sure. thousands of people. Um, I'm going, I'm kind of going through this phase where I'm, I'm like actively practicing like my story selling right through my Instagram captions, emails, blah, blah, whatever. And I've realized, like, I've realized like I got to stop trying to talk to so many different types of people and just talk to like that one audience. Have you, I mean, how, what, what is your, how has your story selling or storytelling changed based on who you're trying to talk to? Yeah, I mean, I, I always thought in the last few years, at least, I'm, I haven't been born with all of this. It's just like, as far as like being comfortable talking to the camera and, and being able to talk to people and have my copywriting and my, my messaging kind of dialed in. Um, I firmly believe that if you go two miles deep and two inches wide rather than two miles wide and, and, and two inches deep, mm -hmm. you're going to get a whole lot further with anything because the, the, the stereotypical saying the riches are in the niches is super true. Yeah. Um, you know, there's people out there that are making six figures selling guides to fly fishermen, right. having channels that teach people how to do woodworking, teach people how to do pottery or gardening or crocheting, macrame, like there's a specialist in all these things. So when you try to be something to everyone, you turn into nothing for no one or everyone. I, don't know. I get what you're I'm saying. I'm not Tony Robbins, man. I'm not Wayne Dyer, but <laughs> the, the issue is if you don't focus on a group of people that you can genuinely help, if you go to the mall or you go to like a huge convention and you had a room full of 10,000 people, how are you supposed to help those 10,000 people? The only way is if you have a message for all 10,000 that you can help them from stage from. So if you go into the mall on black Friday and it's chaotic, how are you going to like grab people individually? Cause they're going to like Dillard's and Macy's and Foot Locker and you get what I'm saying sure. to where, I'd rather go to Dick Sporting Goods if I was looking for athletes. Mm, right. So you do, you have to target. So, you know, when it comes to what I do, I know that I help music creators. 
I help them go further faster with their music creation and their, their music journey. Uh, you know, I have my, my YouTube intro, which is kind of like my mission statement for YouTube. Um, I really want to help people find freedom and fulfillment through taking their passion for making music and turning it into a business of some sort. And I don't expect everyone to do it full time. I think that's a misconception on my channel. I want to help those who are ready to go full time, who are ready to put in the work. But I have just as much fulfillment as, you know, helping Jerry from Idaho uh, make an extra 500 bucks a month with his music or get over the hump that he's been kind of stuck at with getting his music online or, or opening up a merch store or getting some gigs and networking and, and having different opportunities. Or maybe Travis from California has been an artist for 10 years and he's kind of failing at it because he hates being on stage and he has overwhelming anxiety. Maybe I kind of show Travis that there's a different path of, of maybe being a songwriter behind the scenes, maybe kind of working with some sync licensing opportunities in, in order to make money with TV and commercials and not having to do touring and, and things like that. So, you know, with my experience, not only from myself as a producer, but working with a whole ton of artists and other producers and mixing engineers and sync specialists, taking all of my experiences and my 10 plus years corporate marketing experience and injecting that into a different angle and a different viewpoint and framework than anyone is really used to. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So you're, so who is like, so who, who is like your dream customer? Like who is like your main kind of person you're going for? Target audience really a uh, dream really would be a music creator who isn't afraid to be on camera already has music released, wants to scale and wants to eventually have a huge impact, whether that's streams, whether that's touring, whether that's income overall, a, an entire ecosystem that would generate a full-time income would be the goal. Um, but, Honestly, someone that I enjoy their music, someone who is ready to put in the work, isn't an excuse maker, and is coachable, is my dream, my dream client. Yeah, that's 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 awesome. That's cool that you have. I mean, I think a lot of people like. I mean, one thing that's hilarious, you and I will think is funny. Like when I talk to just people who are not musicians, just like giving them advice on social media, for example, and I'm like, oh, well, you do such and such. Like, who who are you trying to go after? Like many. I'm like, oh, right. everybody, my music for everyone. No, it's not. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like I just talked to a homie on the phone. He's trying to do like this kind of music production thing. And I was like, well, what artist do you go for? And he's like, anybody who can pay. And I'm like, that's not who you're going for. And he like laughed. He's like, wait, you're right. That's probably not right. So it's like, it's, it's just what you just said, going two miles wide and two inches deep. That's not as good as going two inches wide, but two miles deep. Like it's all about that depth. Um, you know, I want to, I want to ask about this too. We talked like earlier in convo, you were talking about, and we're in, I'm in the cell music DM group, right? From your cell music masterclass. So many times in the group, Hey, has anyone noticed my engagements dropped? Or Hey, has anyone noticed that you're not getting reach? And, and I literally like, I understand where they're coming from, but I don't care about that stuff. But, but, um, like, like talk about like, cause, cause, cause when I look at my, and sorry if I'm going off a little, I'm trying, I'm coming to a question. Like when my, yeah, when I went with my Instagram, like you look at the amount of followers to likes, like the engagement percentage of mine is like pretty bad if you looked at it, but I'm all about like, dude, like let's just create the depth of the people you do have. If you get a lot of high quality comments and like people who actually like what you're doing, like that's more important than getting tons of likes and comments and shares. Can you like right. speak on a little about how, what's like the mindset to have? Cause I was literally just watching your video on YouTube. Yeah. You were talking about this. What's like the mindset you're supposed to have trying to work and grind when stuff isn't going the way you want. And then also we have to deal with these algorithm changes that seem like the big deal, but they're kind of really not like, what's the mindset to keep yourself going through all these weird challenges. It's looking at things with a realistic perspective and then also realizing that anything you're doing in life has seasons. You have great seasons in a relationship. You might have some downstrokes. You might have some ebbs and flows where it's just like, Things aren't going the same as they used to, but that's life. At one point, I couldn't walk, my friend, wow. when I was like teeny tiny, right? right? And then I learned how to crawl. And then my parents would be like, oh, and praising me for standing up for a few seconds at a time. Right. Everybody wants to be praised for standing up for a few seconds at a time. So they get this dopamine and serotonin release of like, oh, that one post did really well. And now everything's failing. It's not failing. But how many people, and I actually just did a video on this that's going to be going live in the next few days. Okay. Like, 
we chase numbers and we want to get higher and higher and higher in following. And yet we're neglecting everybody who decided to click that follow button. Yep. You're not DMing them. You're not hitting them up on theirs. I see these people that have 150,000 followers and they're following two people. I'm like, who the fuck do you think you are? Like you're going to have either you're paying for your engagement or your mother Teresa herself, rest in peace, or you're just not, you're not caring about your overall engagement. Now I will say this, if you look at it from a realistic perspective, I, it kind of is a pet peeve of mine when people are like, Instagram's not showing my stuff to my audience. Well, yeah, no shit, Sherlock. You have like 5,000 people following you. You think they're going to show yours to every single one of those 5,000 people when those other 5,000 people might be following. But let's do some quick math. And, and just from like a high perspective, sure. if you have 5,000 people following you and every single one of those 5,000 is following 500, mm. at what point does it blow your mind of how much, excuse me, how many pieces of content Instagram's supposed to show all these people? Whoa, that's they, mind blowing. Like if I open my phone right now and I'm following 500 people and 500 people are posting daily, there's not enough minutes in the day for me to go through 500 new posts a day. So Instagram is going to show you what you're interested in based on your likes, based on how much you know, uh, uh, eyeball time you gave to each one. They track when you scroll and you stop, they track how much time you're looking at that thing. And then through the algorithm are ranking what your price, like for instance, do everybody who's watching or listening to this, if you want to test this theory out, go look up newborn babies and Lamborghinis. And then for three days, just stop at every picture of a newborn baby or a Lamborghini, only follow like two accounts, but look at Lamborghinis and newborn babies, like the post, maybe leave a comment or just stay on them for a while, go through the stories. All of a sudden, all your suggests that are going to be the newborn babies and Lamborghinis, you're going to see every single one of their posts because they show you what you engage with. If you're not engaging with your followers at all, yet you're expecting them to engage with you, how do you know if Instagram's even showing you their, them your stuff if you're not interacting with them? They want to show you contact, uh, content from interactive transactions. So if I hit you up, let's say that every single post of yours, I like it and comment. And every single post of mine, you like it and comment. Well, I can almost guarantee that every one of my posts and every one of your posts is going to pop up when I open the app because Instagram's like, Hey, he likes this. Let's show it to him. Now, if uh, let's say I follow newborn babies and Lamborghinis and I don't like any of their posts, I scroll right by them. All of a sudden I'm not going to see their posts and I'm going to have to go double check that I didn't unfollow them. Another thing people do, which is, uh, you know, kind of a behind the scenes uh, piece of information for you guys is all, we all use these hashtags. We all use hashtags to grow this audience but do we go back in later and delete those hashtags after they're no longer relevant? Because Instagram's not continuing to show you that stuff on discover page after like three or four days maximum. So if you go back and delete your hashtags, you reduce your chances of Instagram looking at you as a spam account. Wait, what? Yeah. Wait, so, so that's why I suggest leaving the comments or leaving the hashtags as your first comment because then you don't have to modify your description. You don't have to modify your caption. You go in to a post that's five or six days old and you delete that first comment. Therefore, Instagram doesn't track you as having hashtags on every single one of your posts. And they're like, oh, it's more organic. This guy's not a spammer. What? That's like real? Yeah. <laughs> that's fucking crazy, bro. Hold yeah. on. I mean, I'm guilty of not going back and remembering to, to delete them, but I I, every that. once in a while I'll go through and delete those. Oh, shit. Because Instagram doesn't want you to be a spammer. They, if they think that you're just promoting and trying to kick people off the, the platform, they're not going to show your stuff. Think about it this way, man. If I owned a donut shop and there was a donut shop like a few blocks away, right? Or maybe you owned a croissant shop and you came into my store, you might buy one donut and then I see you going to each one of my customers and saying like, hey, there's a better donut shop down the road or hey, like come with me to my croissant shop. I wouldn't let you in my store. The same with Instagram or YouTube or any of these platforms. If you're pulling people away from me, I'm not going to reward you for that. I'm going to reward you for bringing people in and keeping people here. So, okay, bro. So, like, just to reiterate one more time, Instagram's not broken. What's broken is the way we look at it. We think that 2017 uh, strategies should work in 2020. Things work in seasons, man. And people don't realize that. What's working with an algorithm in, in think about it this way. On YouTube, 
ad spend is higher around Christmas time. You're going to be paid a whole lot more during Christmas time. And then early spring to summer, something transitions. There's slow points because all of these platforms are based on advertisers. All of these platforms are based on user uh, interaction, user time on platform. So the way that you're rewarded by that is by optimizing how you're working based on how their business is running. But nobody sees it like that. They're this, they're in, in entitled, uh, you know, it's a free platform. I, should, I shouldn't have my information recorded. It's like, dude, you know how much money it probably costs to, to develop Instagram and how many hundreds of employees, if not thousands, have to keep it running and maintaining? Like your, our time on the platform and watching ads and clicking through and like sharing and telling people to get on Instagram or TikTok or whatever, like, we're the ones that are generating revenue for them to be able to pay those people to support their family. Some guy right now is working at Instagram, looking at his clock, hoping to go home and having to pick up some SpaghettiOs on the way home because he's not making that much money. But our use of the app is what's paying him. It's not this like free utopian world where just these apps are magic and you know, God runs them. And it's uh -huh. just like, it's a business. It's a, it's a business. Yeah, <laughs> dude, you yeah. just, whoa, bro. That's literally, it just so much just blew my mind. Um, I wanted to ask about something you just said that was, that was really good. Um, <laughs> Sorry. No, don't be, this is, this was literally like, uh, you just schooled me big time. Oh, okay. So when you're, so you said like, I really like how you said things like there's like seasons, like stuff in 2017 isn't going to work in 2020. Yeah. For the most part, the so core foundational marketing strategies will work whether you're selling beats or selling caskets. It's how you do them and how you propose your message and deliver your message to your audience. And all that Instagram is, all that YouTube is, all that the newspaper are, is there, there are avenues in which you could share your message. Instagram is no more important than YouTube is no more important than Twitter is no more important than the newspaper or TV ads. It's how you use them as a tool. Right. So that's actually what I was going to ask those core marketing foundations. I mean, talk about some of those things that will always work through the season. Sure. Are those foundations that no matter what algorithm changes, this is something you should be doing to talk about a couple of those things. Sure. So, uh, personal brand and you know emotional triggers with your audience is always going to strike up interest and strike up uh, intrigue. And so if you can keep a person um, interested in what you are doing, whether it's through a personal brand or through its cre you know, creative marketing around a brand or a business, it's always going to work. I also think that pattern interrupts are incredibly important because people get used to seeing the same old stuff on your page, the same old stuff on your YouTube, YouTube, the same old stuff on, you know, I talk to my team all the time about creating new seasons and new series and new intros and new visuals and, and formatting of my videos and my Instagram stuff. And you're probably seeing now where I'm doing some more memes and, uh, you know, adding some funny stuff in there, but I have serious stuff, you know, in the pipeline that's going to be coming out too. So it's about really being able to latch on and be valuable or, you know, I know that you listen to Andy Frisell as well. And I think in one of his podcasts, he says that, you know, um, content needs to be educational, entertaining, or inspirational, right? So uh, obviously there's, there's some nuance to that. Depends on what your, what your audience is. I mean, if you're Jake Paul, obviously the educational stuff doesn't work as uh, in recent, recent days with his product thing that he launched and it kind of blew up in his face. But you, what I'm getting at here is when you're putting out a message and you have something of value, you just need to be able to get to those eyeballs and those earballs as I say, uh, in order to be able to get to, to garner the reciprocity of attention. What we do in front of screens, in, front, on, in a laptop, we're creating content. Who the f are we to think that we deserve attention? We have to prove to people that we deserve attention. No different than if you're in Southern California and you roll up to a stop sign or stop light and someone's trying to sell you oranges or somebody's trying to sell you flowers at Mother's Day me just opening the window, I'm not going to grab them. I'd like, what is the value proposition based on the investment, whether it be time or, or monetary. So things that work in marketing through and through brand development, whether that's personal brand, whether that's the brand development of a business, 
then you have to have your messaging and your content strategy on lock. You need to learn how to monetize from different avenues. You need to understand how to scale once things are going right. This works whether I'm selling t-shirts or flowers on the side of the road. You need to have messaging and you need to lead with value, right? You need to give somebody a reason to pay attention to you, whether they're, whether you're getting, giving them value with entertainment, whether you're giving them value with a product or a service, you know what I mean? Or, or inspiration because there's been countless people that have made six or seven or eight figure businesses just getting on stage and making people feel like they can do something, Mm. you know, it's all in the delivery, man. It's all in the delivery. Right. So let me, let me, dude, let me ask, I'm going to kind of spell out the way I think it goes, but tell me your thoughts on it. Cause I could be wrong. Right. So everything you said, delivering with value, let's talk about that. So my whole thing is yes, you need to deliver with value. But what I think is my, my thing is I, I, I really take a lot after Gary V sure high quantity but also high quality, but very high quantity of content. He puts out a lot of shit, more yeah. unrealistic for us to be able to put out that much. Like he's got a team of people. Yeah. But I do try to put out as much as possible, whether it's a bunch of Instagram posts, YouTube videos, whatever. Um, so my thing was, okay, if I'm going to put out that much material, the, 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 the quality of the value isn't going to go down, but like maybe like the audio quality isn't going to be like the most amazing thing. Right. You know what I mean? Or like the Instagram post isn't going to be a professional photographer every time. It might just be a picture on my phone. Um, yeah, nothing it, wrong with that, man. No, nothing wrong at all. Which by the way, <laughs> your YouTube videos that I watched a really long time ago, the 33 or it was like 30, 30, 30. And you, you like showed how to like leave your phone on. Like, oh yeah. The 33% uh, rule, the, the, the soda can one. Yeah. And then you, yeah. you, you were the one who, who had told me about the app Snapseed on that video. Snapseed is, yeah. I wish I could buy stock at Snapseed. I love that app. Yeah. yeah. So that anyway, so you like, I mean, that was huge. I remember that video helped me, but my whole thing is, Yes, you can provide value, but if you just put out like one post, one, and it had all this value, it's like sick, dude. Like that's going to last somebody like maybe 30 seconds or a minute or four, right. maybe, maybe five minutes. And then they're on to the next thing. So my whole thing is like what I've started to see with artists that I know personally and artists who are on my Instagram or email list is they're not able to set up what they need to set up to be constantly putting shit out. You know, like you have, been, you have been able to figure out a way to put out YouTube videos super frequently and Instagram posts frequently. And so, so my whole thing is like, before you, like, before you even fi- like a lot of people are like, I need to figure out my brand. What is my, yeah, yeah, that's important. But to me, it's like, why not just start and figure out a way to put out all of the content. It's almost like setting up your foundation. I mean, can sure. you talk about like the personal development and the mindset that it takes to just say, Hey, I need to like put out stuff all the time and then talk about the importance of putting out stuff all the time. Yeah. So, I mean, people ask me uh, relatively frequently, they say like, Adam, how do you stay so consistent? Adam, how do you put out so much? It's because I don't want the life I came from. And it's more important to me to put out stuff and keep moving forward than become, become complacent from what I've done in the last year. A lot of people want change, but they don't really want change. They, they like the concept of change, but they don't actually put in the work to see change. And once they put in a little bit of work, then they're like, well, that's, that's all it should take, right? No, there's no finish line. There's no finish line as, as an entrepreneur. We, we climb a ladder that doesn't have a top rung, like I say in some of my posts, mm-hmm. but we have to enjoy the journey. You know, we see clouds. We have to be in, enjoying the clouds and uh, the view from the top of the ladder and while we're continuing to climb. The issue is so many people go out and they start making excuses as, as to why they need to have this framework and they need to start and these need to be perfect, right? Oh, my video needs to be perfect. I need to have a better camera. I need to have a better lens. I need to understand video editing. I need to do this and this. You know, there's an old uh, wives tale or whatever um, that I that I absolutely love and it's this art professor that brings in a new semester of students. And then in this semester, he does an experiment. He says, okay, there's 40 of you, 20 of you go to this side of the room, 20 of you go to that side of the room. For the entire semester, I want this side of the room to focus on creating pottery, creating vases and, and mugs and stuff that are absolutely perfect. Focus on making perfect pottery for the entire semester. 
this side of the group, I just want you to make as much as you can. It doesn't have to be perfect. Make vases, make mugs, make plates, make whatever you want, bowls, you, you name it, knock yourself out. At the end of that semester, the professor comes in and says, okay, you have all of your presentations here. They're not labeled, but on, on the bottom is a one or a two, group one, the perfect, group two, the quantity, you know, so quality versus quantity. And at the end of judging the entire lot of pottery, the uh, side of the, the side of the room that was responsible for having perfect pottery had none of the perfect pots. The side of the room that was responsible for quantity had so much practice and repetition that through their practice and repetition, they became master craftsmen of pottery. And all of the perfect or near perfect uh, examples were from the quantity group because these people were so focused on making perfect art, perfect pottery, that anytime something was off, they'd start over. They'd waste all this time. And at the end of the semester, they only had five or six pieces to submit when this side of the room had three or 400. And out of those three or 400, you have gems. You have, you have perfect examples. And, th and so people want to be perfect without putting in the work. And you have, to, you have to start with crawling through the shit before you can appreciate the sunny days and, and get up on your feet and actually be good at it and actually have an appreciation for where you are in that moment based on where you started. You know, it's easy to make excuses these days, but it's even, even harder to justify those excuses because when you really cut through a lot of the bullshit, it's just an excuse. And you could have done, you know, five times as much as, as you thought you could in a, a lot of time that you're complaining that you didn't have enough of. Right. You know? Dude, that is so, I love, the, really what I feel like you just said, the theme you were driving home was the practice and the repetitions. And it's yeah, like, man. And so really quick, like maybe the last thing, cause I know you have to go soon. No uh, problem. No problem. The, the difference I really, this is going to be very honed into rappers and producers and musicians. The sure. difference between making a song and not putting it out and the difference between making a song and putting it out. Right. Cause I always tell, I, I have friends who work on music and they make music a lot, but they never sure. put it out. And it's like, dude, you don't. And they're like, I'm improving as an artist. And I go, but you're not as much because when I put out music and put it out and I get feedback organically and then I'm like, right. maybe the snare was too loud or, oh, I like this part. I hear it just organically. That's way different than you just listening to it or you and one other person or you and two other people putting it out and then also feeling that pressure. Yeah. Talk about the difference right there between when you put something out to the public and then getting feedback as opposed to you just holding on, holding on, holding on. What's the difference in improvement? It's ego and it's uh, subjective feedback and criticism, right? So we can think that a song is absolutely perfect. And then if we just wait and wait and wait and wait and wait until we put it out to, to get our, our praises because it's perfect. And the first person that listens to it says, I can't understand what you're saying. The vocal's too low. Then we're devastated, <laughs> right. right? Instead of putting a song out that we're confident in, you know, done is better than perfect as Casey Neistat says. And so it's like, I can't give you a critique on what you're doing wrong on Instagram with one post, aside from you've done one post. But through patterns, through looking at 30 different releases, I could say, okay, overall, this is really what you need to tweak. Your, your captions might not have very engaging copy. Your images are dark or uh, you're too repetitive. If you just release one song here, one song there, you have no episodes. If a person goes on TV to watch The Walking Dead and they watch the first episode and they're like super geared up and super just connected, and then they have no idea when the next episode's coming out, if there's going to be a next episode or if the next episode's going to follow along with the storyline of the first one, they're not going to be vested into watching that. They're going to say, no, 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 I'm not getting into that because I'm, I'm going to be heartbroken because something I'm really interested in isn't giving me what I want, my fix. So as an artist, as a producer, if you're not cranking out enough quantity, it doesn't have to be perfect, but if you're not cranking out enough quantity and having your voice heard and building an origin story through your music, then you're not doing anything. You're just talking about a music career. You, you have a hobby on your hands that you are uh, upset if your mom tells you to you know, go back to working at Wendy's. Like, mom, I have a music career. No, you don't. You have a hobby. Right. You know, the, the thing is, us as music creators, are, we have very fragile egos. I mean, even, even myself at some point, sure. I, I, I take negative feedback kind of personally because we love what we do so much and we want, we want to be recognized for what we know it is and what we think it is sometimes more than what it actually is. 
Right. There's times where I put out a video. I'm like, this is going to hit. This is amazing. I love this. Doesn't get any views. Doesn't get any comments. People are kind of cold about it. It happens all the time. And then I'm like, you know what? Watching this, it didn't connect the way I wanted it to because I missed X, Y, Z, because I didn't apply this to it, right? There was something missing. Unless you put out consistent content, you're not going to understand what you're missing. And until you are brave enough to let your voice be heard when it's not perfect, you're never going to have a fan base who wants to see you do better. Mm. Your fan base wants to see you do better. No fan base. How many people have you followed over the years, right? Who you could, you could tell a friend like, oh, I've been following him since before he blew up. I've been listening to their music since some project that's five years old. If nobody has an origin story and they just come out polished, what are they, what are they called? They're called an industry plant. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, everybody kind of looks at them with resentment because they don't feel relatable. They don't feel like, oh, I relate to this person because he isn't perfect, but he has a voice and there's passion and there's organic just drive behind it. And, and you ever hear an artist after they're like five or six albums in and it just feels like the life is kind of removed from the projects? Yeah. You wouldn't want to come to market with that, right? You want life in your projects. Sometimes that does mean a snare a little bit too loud. That sometimes that does mean you screwed up, but you didn't have, you know, studio time to go back in and, and, and change the lyrics. So it just went from blah, 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 blah. Then you like mumble something and all of a sudden that's the, your audience's favorite part of the song. You know, like for all they know, you did that on purpose. Right. So for an artist or a producer or even a content creator on YouTube, you have to put out products in order to get better. You can't grow an audience with no product. It's like inviting people to a store in the mall and having three things on the shelf. You can't possibly expect them to stay around. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, people spend all this time marketing and branding and you know, we see it all the time in my DMS. It's just like, bro, like, why am I not growing? Bro, 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 bro. I get a ton of bro stuff. Right. And so <laughs> I'm like, why I'm, I'm like, you're not growing because you have three posts on Instagram in the last six months. You're not growing because you have one song released on SoundCloud two years ago. You, you're, you're sitting and dwelling on something that's the past. Instagram posts are hot for like 12 hours, man. And people spend weeks cultivating content for it. It's like, bro, nobody's going to see this shit next week. Right. Even if it's still on your profile, unless you get the random weirdo that comes through your profile and likes 45 of your pictures, they're not going back to see. That's why you can repurpose content. That's why on my Instagram, I, after you know three or six months, I'll repost it with a new caption or the same caption because if I gained 5,000 followers or 10,000 followers, they haven't seen that yet. That's new to them. That's real. It's just like, you know, I love Seinfeld and some other shows, but like there are episodes that still are elusive to me that I've never seen, even though it's in a show that's 20 years old now, if it came up on TV, I'd be like, oh shit, I want to see that. People want your old stuff that aren't familiar with that. So you need to build an ecosystem and you also need to, just like I say, purpose-driven music marketing, you need to have a purpose for the reason, the, the pieces of content. What is the reason for your content? Is it for engagement? Is it just for, you know, a little bit of community building on that platform or is it to drive somebody to a landing page? Is it to drive somebody to your music? Is it to get someone to share? Like so many people throw things at the wall with no purpose. They have no idea what a flow chart should look like from that to that to that. Mm -hmm. This podcast, for example, just breaking down marketing. You're going to post this somewhere. Somebody might listen to it who's not familiar with me. They might find my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Adam Ivy or my website, adamivy.com, sellmusic.com. And they'll go to that and then they'll discover my content. They'll be like, oh, I want to see what he's doing behind the scenes. So I'll follow him on Instagram. And then Instagram turns into my podcast that I release that they listen to. And then I might interview you or, you know, Dylan Graham or another one of my producer friends, and then they'll discover that. So it's a chain reaction. And ultimately somebody who's listening to this right now might find my YouTube content. Thanks to you. Thanks to you. Then my Instagram. And then they, they might say, you know what? I like this guy. I think that he could help me. And then ultimately he might become a student just like you, an alumni of the Cell Music Masterclass. And you know, for, for the connecting points, if you don't have those connecting points in play, it's a dead end. And then what's the point of spending all this time and energy and financial resources, you know, uh, uh, focus on things that are not connecting with anything else. Mm -hmm. Connection is what we're trying to do with social media. It's social media, social interactions. 
but so many times we just hit a wall and it's like, okay, this content, I'll, I'll have a photographer take a photo in front of this rented Ferrari and my caption says, live in the dream. <laughs> Where is that going? Where is that going? It's going nowhere. Right. No context, you know? Dude. Yeah. A hundred percent. Well, Adam, look, I want to be, you know, conscious of your time. I know you said we had about an hour and we got started like 56 minutes ago. So <laughs> maybe you're good. Like, man. You're good. No. And like, I just, you kind of just started plugging a little but plug yourself a little more, all the links that you want people to try to go to Sam loud and proud. I'll post them in the description of this podcast and on the YouTube video. Hey man, I appreciate that. And side note, if you have a brand, if, if you're trying to start a business, if you're trying to build your voice as a music creator, don't be afraid to put your link out there. Just don't spam people with it. Wait till the right time. And apparently it's the right time. So if you want to connect with me, Instagram at Adam Ivy, you can find me on most platforms at Adam Ivy. Uh, if you want to go to my channel uh, on YouTube, either go to youtube.com slash Adam Ivy, or just go to channelfamily.com uh, or marketyourmusic.com that both redirects directly to my YouTube channel for easy branding. Um, in the next few weeks, I'm going to be opening up enrollment to the Cell Music Masterclass. So you could be a peer uh, to Lee in the alumni realms of the Cell Music Masterclass. Just go to Cell Music Masterclass. No, that's not right. Go to cellmusic.com. It's the easiest one. Um, and you can get on the early bird waiting list. I'm also going to be launching a 20 Days of Focus 2.0 challenge here in the next few days, which I'm really excited to, uh, to announce because it's going to change a lot of people's lives. In fact, I'd love for you to participate even as a Cell Music Masterclass alumni, uh, alumni man. Um, a lot of great things to try to move the needle forward, try to help people get to the next step and get some clarity, focus and understanding on what they're doing. Yeah, no, I would love to. I, I remember the, the older 20 days of focus challenge. That was a, that was dope. Uh, guys, like seriously, if you are a musician or rapper, like most of the people seeing this are going to be rappers or producers or musicians, you guys need to follow Adam Ivy. Like Adam Ivy has been growing. Like I said, I followed him when he had 50,000 subscribers. Now he's at 170,000. And I remember when you had about 30,000 Instagram followers, now you're at 50,000. Like this guy's Adam Ivy grows and all he does is bring constant value. It's not that difficult to understand his YouTube videos. Um, I seriously recommend going through it. And I also purchased his cell music masterclass a while ago and all the people that I've been able to network through that really have helped my career. Like, I don't know, Adam, if you saw, but like one of the other students, her name's Anjanette Lene. She and I yeah. both live in the Bay area. And so we physically met, like I have a post from a while ago. She came over here. We made a song. It was a song I put out called doing the most where she made the beat and we did a yeah. podcast and YouTube video together all off of your platform that we like connected with. So um, yeah. So like guys, like highly recommend getting in with Adam and his community and like just start to engage with Adam and Adam engages with me all the time. I see Adam like my posts. So he's not just a dude who's like posting and then like ignoring you. He's not a hundred thousand followers and only following two people. Adam engages with the community. Uh, and Adam, I appreciate your time a lot. I won't take up any more. Um, hey, thanks for having me on the show, man. I'm, I'm glad to be able to not only connect with you as one of my students. So it's surreal to watch your growth and, you know, for what it's worth, man, I'm super proud of everything that you've been implementing and your uh, drive and your consistency has been really impressive. Just kind of behind the scenes, I've been watching it. That's why I've been, been engaging with your stuff. And uh, it's, it's quite an honor to be, be able to connect with your people through your, the show that you've built here. Thank you so much, man. All right. Well, hey, I'm not going to take up any more of your time. I appreciate everything, man. And um, thanks for having me, man. No, thank you. You have so a great rest of your day. Thanks, brother. You too. See you later. Talk to you. Bye. Later, Lee.